Bill, hello and uh, welcome to uh, our series of talks on the Gospel of John. Uh, for those I haven't met, uh, my name is David. I'm one of the team here at St. Paul's Howell Hill. And as we are taking this time, the gift of this time, a great evil though COVID-19 is proving to be, we're taking the time and the opportunity to pause to reflect as we prepare to emerge from lockdown, to pause and reflect on what it means to be church. And in the services, which you can join us on at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, uh, I and others have been talking about the book of uh, Acts, the experience of the early church. We're also in these additional talks looking at the gospel, the, the account of Jesus's life written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, John, who uh, wrote his disciple, uh, wrote his gospel late in the first century, uh, brings to it um, depth of theological understanding, which is uh, truly beautiful and is so prized by the church. So as we put to aside all that kind of church is and has become, we're trying as we journey through this to hear the words of Jesus and to reinterpret them for our church and for our age. We're in John chapter four, uh, the woman uh, at the well. And uh, last week, uh, uh, my colleague Martin, uh, our vicar, uh, he uh, led us into the first part of this discussion. He talked about this woman um, who was uh, a Samaritan. The Samaritans uh, were distinct from the, uh, the, peop from, from the Jews insofar as uh, they had uh, married out into other groups. Um, there was a degree of uh, enmity between the two groups. There was a differences in theology. There was still a desire to follow God. And this woman that Jesus met at the well was out gathering water at the heat of the day because she was um, in disgrace for reasons which become evident. And she wants to avoid the company of uh, the other women who would come out in the cool of the evening. Martin identified for us um, uh, four key themes here. First of all, it's interesting that Jesus chose to go through Samaria. He didn't need to take that route. As he sought his destination going from Judea to Galilee, he could have taken uh, another route, but something, maybe the Holy Spirit impelled him to go. Secondly, he chose not only to talk to somebody who A, was a woman, and that was pretty unthinkable, but B, was a Samaritan, um, uh, and somebody who, uh, whose life was, uh, was less than perfect, he chose to give her his time and he chose to put himself in her debt by allowing her to draw water for him. He bridged difference, difference of sex and race. What a relevant theme that is in our present age. And he used the analogy of drink and thirst to encourage her in what proved ultimately, as you'll hear from Sally next week, to be a wonderful uh, evangelistic encounter. He used the, uh, the analogy of thirst and of water to lead her, uh, into, uh, to lead her into relationship with God um, in and through him. I want to say a little bit, um, Martin said we'll be saying more about water this week. Uh, the image of thirst or the analogy of thirst is really very powerful. Uh, Martin was uh, filming his talk on the hottest day of the year, uh, taking water as he went and was uh, uh, complaining about the immense deprivation which this, uh, this represented. Um, thirst in biblical times was absolutely overwhelming and dire. We see in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for water. 
a spring of water living up to eternal life, water that she may never be thirsty, promises, uh, promises the scripture. There is um, the idea that uh, you know, Jesus on the cross speaks, he said, I thirst. And they offered him vinegar, which he refused. He thirst because he was separated from the presence of God for which we are designed to ache. And so the image against this thirst, this desire for connection, this emptiness at the heart of all of us until we come to meet Jesus. Because of this thirst, there is enormous power in the concept and the teaching on water. In uh, the passage I was looking at this morning, Acts 3.19, um, there's an invitation by Peter to turn to, Jesus, to turn to Jesus, to repent that our sins may be forgiven and the times of refreshment will come. There's the image of purity and cleanliness. Hebrews 10 verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed clean with pure water. Isaiah, with joy you will joy draw water from the wells of salvation and the picture and revelation of the waters of life, sustaining life. Water is boundless. I love that uh, song. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains opened deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers flowed incessant from above. My invitation to you today, if you're dry, if you're hungry, is to stand in the river. Let the torrent of God's goodness and love and grace and healing power refresh you. Stand in the water. Let's look at the passage. That's where we're up to. So she gets to the point of saying, well, I like the sound of this water. I am thirsty. Can I have some, please? And um, Jesus says, let's go and find, if, get a Bible if it's helpful for you. Uh, John chapter 4, verses 16 to 26. Jesus says, go call your husband and come back. He changes the subject. Why? I think because he knows there's an issue here that needs to be dealt with. He knows why she is aching and thirsty. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five and the man you're now with is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Understatement. How does she react when Jesus puts his finger on an area of sin. She just wants the water, but we can't get the water until we come to Jesus and allow him to wash us clean from the filth which is already there. So how does she do it? She does what we often do. She changes the subject. Um, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Well, there's a theological question here. I think the Jews saw Mount Zion in Jerusalem as being the holy mountain, whereas the um, Samaritans saw Mount Gerizim in Samaria. But why does she go off on one? Some great discussion of theology. She's changing the subject to avoid a painful area. But also, she's kind of saying, well, you know, it's all you know, all this faith stuff, there's no consensus, is there? And because there's no consensus about theology, she is about to argue, I would contend, 
Because there's no consensus about theology, that means there's no consistent moral code which tells you, which enables you to tell me to stop sleeping around. And uh, I tell you, as I talk to people today, don't we often see the same kind of thing? People go, oh, well, there's multiple faiths, you know, pick one, it doesn't really matter. And yet there is such a thing as truth. If Islam says that Jesus is a dead prophet whose bones are in the dust of Palestine, and Christianity says he is the risen son of God, living in relationship with us in the power of the Holy Spirit, they can't both be right. Or people say, well, you know, I, I haven't had a very good experience of church. You know, I had a very strict upbringing and then we went to this church where the vicar went mad or whatever. As if that's some kind of excuse for not building a relationship with Jesus. Now, churches are human institutions. We get things wrong. But Jesus doesn't get things wrong. And my call to you today is not to let experiences of Christianity or unkind things, God forgive them, said by people who call themselves Christian in years past, do not let them rob you of the opportunity to come into relationship with Jesus now. They're excuses, they're barriers which would rob you of joy and peace and purpose and freedom from all the hurts in our past lives. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming. Actually, the Greek says an hour is coming. He's talking about the hour of his crucifixion and then being brought back to life. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, etc. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The wonderful promise of this scripture is that the time when we needed to go into a building to encounter God is past. In uh, Old Testament times, they built the temple and the God was seen to reside in the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the vicar would, not the vicar, sorry, the priest or the high priest or whatever, would go in to the Holy of Holies with a rope around his ankle in case he was overcome by the presence and power of God so that they could pull him out. Whereas now, because uh, Jesus went to the cross, because his Holy Spirit spirit of the living God was released on the disciples at Pentecost and then is released on all of us who decide to love and follow Jesus. He doesn't dwell in the temple. He doesn't dwell exclusively in church buildings or any of the apparatus of church. He dwells in the power of his spirit in you and in me. And day by day, he conforms. We are instantly saved the moment that we say yes to Jesus. But then we are gradually, through the work of the Spirit in us, gradually conformed to his likeness. We don't turn into clones of each other, but all the hurt and the coping mechanisms which are part of life are gradually stripped away. And we, day by day, start to see the world as he sees the world, to operate in the power of the Spirit, to understand what is happening spiritually as well as physically. We are given a heart of compassion that we may see people and situations as he would see them. And we're equipped to work with the Holy Spirit who is already working in the world to change lives and to build his kingdom here. 
That is the big adventure. That is the joy which comes when we allow this boundless stream of living water to flow up from within. That is the invitation that Jesus put to the woman in Samaria. That is the invitation he puts to you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We come to you thirsty, knowing of all the shortcomings in our lives. We pray now that you will help us to repent and turn away from the things which are bad. And in the name and authority of Jesus, we now receive that living water. Flow into us, transform us, fill us with your joy and purpose, and use us to change the world. Amen.